Well, good morning again, everyone. Good morning. It is lovely to see so many out at church this morning. Um, I'm looking at the time here, and I think we're going to be a little under the hour. Um, I am not one to keep going on and on, um, uh, unlike others, but... Um, <laughs> So it will be short and sweet this week and I hope you don't mind but this is what the Lord has laid on my heart to bring to the service this morning. So this morning we're going to take a look at the book of Matthew. This is a familiar passage but one that we maybe don't think about too much and we maybe don't even know all that much about. We just know that it was one of the many miracles performed by Jesus uh, in the New Testament. So I want to spend the next few minutes delving a little bit deeper with this story in order to fully understand how important this miracle is. Just before we do it, I know we've already prayed, but we're going to just do another wee short prayer. So close your eyes with me and we'll, we'll pray together. Father, still our hearts for a few moments. Let us hear your still small voice. Help us to fully understand this passage and its meaning. For in your name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Aren't holidays great? Yes. Yep, I love to get away on holiday. It's lovely to get away from everything. Just down tools, take a rest, um, change up the routine, get away from work. Yes. And sometimes, if we're honest, we can even say, admit that it's nice to get away from people. <laughs> Just to breathe a little bit, get a piece of, a bit of peace and quiet. There are times when we all feel like this and just need to be alone. I believe it's a necessity in order to cope with what life throws at us. Get your head shard and just be alone. But there's being alone for a bit of rest and relax relaxation and there is being lonely. And I believe that there is a big difference between those two. Loneliness to me suggests isolation, whether that be of your own doing or somebody else's doing. Some people are naturally introverted and they don't particularly like to interact with other people. And that's fine. Everybody is different. Some people are just not nice people. Maybe they have unpleasant personality traits or they just rub us up the wrong way. I have met a few people like that in my time. Thankfully not in this church, but I have met a few. But because of their behaviour and attitude, this may cause them to lose friends and to be left feeling isolated and alone. Loneliness can be a very suffocating place. This morning I want to speak briefly about a man in the Bible who was lonely. His loneliness wasn't because he was an introvert and preferred his own company, nor was it because he was an unpleasant person who spat venom every time he talked to people or rubbed them up the wrong way. His loneliness was because he had one of the most deadly and debilitating diseases that you could get in biblical times. A disease that made society hate you. A disease where religious leaders and rabbis avoided you. A disease that made you feel unwanted, unloved and ugly. This man had leprosy. So let me tell you a little bit about the disease of leprosy. If you had leprosy, there were physical effects. There were obvious, noticeable signs to tell a person that you had leprosy. There was a thickening of the skin. Growths and sores began to appear all over your body. Your nerve ends started to die. Your fingers started to curl. Your eyes, ears, nose and feet were all affected. Your respiratory system was affected. You couldn't breathe properly. And your voice got very low and became quite gruff. Now, if that wasn't enough to deal with, 
there were also social effects of having leprosy. So if you had leprosy, you were cut off from your family, your children, your spouse. Now, other than my love for God, the most precious and dear things to me on earth here are my husband and my three children. There is no one and nothing that I love more than my family. And I can't imagine ever being separated just for a short period of time from my family. But yet, if, if I had been diagnosed with leprosy in biblical times, I would have been completely separated from my family permanently, not just temporarily, permanently. So you're cut off from your family. You're also isolated from society. You had to leave your home and you were banished to the outside of the city walls. Not only did you leave your family, but you lost your home, left your town and had to start all over again, alone. No family, isolated from society and required by law to announce yourself when you were entering the city. And if you didn't announce yourself, you were faced with the possibility of death, possibly by stoning. So if you had leprosy, you couldn't just walk freely around the countryside and go where you wanted. Every single place that you went to, you had to warn people that you were on your way. You had to announce your presence and make sure that everybody knew to keep your distance, their distance from you. You had to cry out, unclean, unclean, everywhere that you went. The belief that leprosy was so <coughs> contagious meant that nobody wanted to be near you. Nobody wanted to talk to you. And nobody even wanted to breathe the same air that you breathe, breathed. This disease acts like an anaesthetic because at the beginning, yes, you can feel pain. But over the years, you feel your nerves start to die and you're left feeling numb. Imagine breaking your ankle and not knowing that you've done it. Or cutting the tip off your finger and not feeling anything. Flesh, tissue, tendons could all be torn and you don't know that this has happened because you can't feel it. Going too close to the fire and not knowing that you've burnt your fingers. This is what leprosy was. <coughs> it was not something that you could hide from people. There was no chance of recovering from it in biblical times. And it was like a death sentence. John Curson, a well-known American pastor and author, wrote this. Lepers in Jesus' day would begin to take on very gross appearances as their skin became hard and scaly and their fingers and toes disappeared. Their faces became lion-like, swollen with huge folds. There would also be a strong odour emanating from the body of one who had leprosy. We are told a leper could be smelt from 100 feet away. Imagine having all that to deal with. <coughs> we read in Leviticus chapter 13 verses 45 and 46. It speaks of leprosy and it says, Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes. Let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have this disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside of the camp. Now, after painting this picture, with all this information in mind, we start to understand a little of the loneliness the feeling of despair and the sadness that this man would have had. He was genuinely alone. So let's take a look at the book of Matthew. Jamie read it for us earlier. It is Matthew chapter 8 verses 1 to 4. When Jesus came from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, 
you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now previously in chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, we read about the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. Through Jesus' teachings on the mountain that day, we were given a list of commands. And Jesus tells us how we should treat other people. He also tells us that if we need anything, we are to ask him for it. And he tells us how we should be living as Christians. People gathered and listened to Jesus on the mountainside and they were overwhelmed by his radical teachings. They were amazed by his authority by which he spoke and were drawn to him. They were drawn to his teachings. The final verses in chapter 7 say, When Jesus had finished these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The crowds loved him. They were in awe of him. So much so that after coming back down the mountain in chapter 8, we are told that large crowds followed him. They wanted to hear more of this exciting new teaching. He had captivated them and no one had ever taught the way that Jesus taught. Jesus said things on the mountainside like, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. Well, that was a radical new teaching. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This was great stuff. This was unbelievable. They had been so used to a cold, lifeless religion that was based on a code of behaviour. And now Jesus was teaching in a vibrant, exciting, new way. His words brought hope. But up until this point, this is just what they were, words. They hadn't actually seen anything to collaborate the new teachings and vibrant ways that Jesus was talking about. Where was the proof? Verse 2 reads, A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This is a man that is not allowed to be in crowds of people. This is a man that has lost all hope and knows that his condition is a death sentence. This is a man who risked certain death, death just to be in the presence of Jesus and coming close to him. But yes, he risked the shouting. He risked the backlash the nasty comments that he would get by being near Jesus that day because he had faith that Jesus could take away his disease. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He didn't say, Lord, would you try and make me clean? He said, you can make me clean. There was no doubt in his mind that the Lord could heal him. The question was, would Jesus be willing to heal him? You know, in biblical times, anyone that had anything wrong with them were considered to be unclean and deemed to have done something wrong. If you had any affliction at all, if you were sick, if you were impaired in any way, it was seen as a punishment from God for something that you had done wrong. This was the law and the beliefs at that time. This man's leprosy meant that he was physically and morally unclean. In, everyone, in everyone's eyes, this man was a sinner. <coughs> Religious leaders and rabbis didn't go anywhere near anyone that had sinned. They stayed away from sick people. 
So why would this new radical teacher named Jesus be any different to the other leaders? Well, he was. He was compassionate, he was loving, he was kind, and he was not afraid of catching anything from this man with leprosy. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus answered in verse 3, I am willing. Be clean. Can you imagine the reaction from the crowd that day? I'd say stunned would have been an understatement. Considering you're not allowed within six feet of a person with leprosy, here comes this radical new leader who not only went close to the man with leprosy, but he actually reached out and touched this man with leprosy. According to the law, anyone that had come into contact with a leper would have had to go through an elaborate cleansing ritual before he was allowed to go back <coughs> into the temple. It was simply not done. It was a big no-no. But here we see a beautiful picture of Jesus leading by example, putting into actions what he instructed us to do. Through Jesus' encounter with the man with leprosy that day, we see his words in action. He was putting his own commands into practice. Now, everyone has something that they're afraid of. I think if I went round the room today, everyone would be able to give me something that scares them. It could be a fear of heights, it could be a fear of spiders, or a fear of flying in an aeroplane. For me, I have a massive fear of mice. <laughs> Little tiny mice. I don't know why something so small uh, terrifies me so much. But the sight of a mouse can make me physically weak. First comes the scream. Then my breathing starts to get a little bit quicker. And then a sweat will break on my brow. And the fear of, of the feeling of fear and panic is unbelievable. It just gives me the heebie jeebies. I don't do mice. So on Friday night in our house, we had a bit of an ordeal, and you can imagine what's coming. There was a mouse in our living room. Oh. Now, I don't have a sporty physique, as you can tell. And in fact, I admit freely that I am built for comfort, not for speed. Okay? But when I saw that mouse on Friday night, I was at the top of our sofa in 0.2 seconds. I was on the sofa so, so quick. I squealed, I panicked, and I started to sweat. And I tried to get out of its way. And I see my children smiling because they thought it was very funny laughing at me trying to get away from the, this mouse, mouse. I tried to get out of its way. Now, all joking aside, that reaction that I had to the mouse the outburst and the running away is most likely the same reaction that people had to a person that was affected by leprosy. They feared this disease. They did everything they could to avoid coming into contact with someone who was affected. They panicked, they probably squealed, and they would run away. Let me tell you about a little boy called Musa. Now many of you know what I do during the week. You know what job I have during the week and the Ministry of Kids for School in Tanzania. Well, in many African countries and other countries across the world as well, there are ch children who are born that are simply not wanted. Not wanted because they're affected maybe by albinism, not wanted because they maybe have an impairment or a deformity. Not wanted because they can't move their arms or they can't move their legs. Or not wanted like little Musa because he is blind. You see, these children 
are seen to have no place in the family because they cannot contribute to the upkeep and the running of the home. They are no, of no help or use to the parents. So they're locked away in mud huts and not cared for at all. They're shunned and they are ignored. They barely get enough food because food costs money and these children can't earn their keep. There is little or no interaction from the parents or the siblings and they, these children are left feeling alone, unloved, unwanted and useless. This is what happened to little Musa. He was identified as being in great need and was immediately brought into our care. When he arrived, he wouldn't lift his head. He continuously looked down to the ground. He'd lost interest in everything. He never smiled or showed any emotion at all. He had lost hope. Now I can only imagine that this is how the man with leprosy felt. Alone, abandoned and without hope. Thankfully, little Musa is a different boy today. He now interacts with other children. He eats regularly and he feels loved and wanted. Now I am in no way suggesting that the miracles of Jesus uh, are the same as caring for a little blind boy in Tanzania. But Jesus practiced what he preached. His own works, the things he did for people, the way that he lived on this earth, all confirmed the words that he spoke while he was on the mountain in chapter seven. He instructed people on how they should live and he lived out what he said. Here we see how Jesus was willing to not only come into contact with someone who was deemed sinful, but he was also willing to take away that sin completely. And you know, there is nobody on this earth, earth that God wouldn't do the same for today. God has already forgiven our past. He sanctified and cleansed our sin when he died on the cross. Through our sin, though our sin may have contaminated our lives like leprosy did to the man in the story in Matthew, it can be clean. I praise God that there is no one that is too low, too far gone, too evil, too dirty or too sinful for Jesus to forgive and cleanse. No one is too sick for Jesus to heal. All it took was a touch from the master's hand. That's all. This man came with full confidence that Christ could heal him. He came in humility, not demanding. He didn't demand that Jesus healed him. He said, if you are willing. He came in reverence, bowing down low before Jesus. And Jesus said, I am willing. He was willing then and he is willing today. Imagine the joy of this man. The disease was gone. The condemnation was gone. The stigma was gone. The loneliness that had surrounded his life for so many years was gone. Jesus did that. Listen to these words of Lyle Rawlings. I read this a couple of weeks ago and I had never heard it before, but the words are so beautiful. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He did not live in a castle, yet they called him Lord. He ruled no nations, yet they called him King. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. 
the greatest man in history, and his name is Jesus. Jesus, just as Jesus did all those years ago, he <clears throat> will certainly do it again today. All we have to do is ask. No matter the problem, whether it be health, finances, relationships, maybe our own faith that we're having problems with, bring it to Jesus. He may not have the answer straight away, but he will answer you and me. A little chorus we used to sing whenever I was young. Let's make it our prayer today. It went like this. Reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. You'll find he's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. Will you reach out in faith and confidence today? I trust you will. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our final hymn. Uh, this is a great hymn. You'll probably gather that I enjoy my hymns. I love to sing the hymns. The chorus for this one says, Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, O oh, glorious day. <laughs> 